Many of you, like me, have heard this guy speak this phrase. I am building an airplane. I'm building an airplane from a box. I am building an airplane. 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 For years. Well, guess what? He built the airplane. Some of you think I spent way too much on my airplane. And I tackled him during the world's largest air show, AirVenture EAA Oshkosh. All right, here at Oshkosh 2025, here with, I'm not sure if it's Carson or Wearworthy. I get often confused with that. But, both work. Uh, both work. Yeah. When I forget Carson, I remember Wearworthy, right? Anyway, he finished this beautiful Super Duty, probably the most customized Super Duty ever built from a Zenith line. And uh, I guess first off, I ask these people all the time when, when they're building aircraft, like what was the most challenging and it was the most rewarding part of the, uh, the build process. The last 10% was by far the most challenging. There is okay. no joke. 90% done, 90% to go. That is, I laughed, at. I laughed for years at that. No, it is 100% true. That is, it was very, just the combination of putting everything together, getting the engine, getting the avionics, wiring, making it all work and communicate, that was a lot of work. It, it's a lot of sleepless nights. So, yeah. uh, most rewarding, just every milestone. Like, every time that you're feeling like you're lagging and things are hard, sure. you put it on the wheels and you put it on its gear and you're like, oh my God, it's becoming an airplane. You get the wings on and it just slowly becomes more and more and every single time it's like that hit of like, the dopamine hit. Sure. Like, okay, this is happening. So, so good point. So along the way on the milestones, what are some of the ones that you did it and then as you're leaving the hangar of the shop, you look back, you're like, dang, I got that done. Name, uh, name a couple of those milestones. Yeah, the big one, the wings going on, huge. Yeah. Honestly, the cowling going on. Yeah. I had a lot of like worries. This is the first time in like it's on this way or that yeah. way. Yeah. Well, an IL-390 has never been on a Zenith Super Duty. In fact, I don't think there is a flying Zenith with an IL-390 on okay. it. So, there was a lot of risk there buying, sure. you know, the firewall forward for the Lycoming like engines that uh, Zenith provides, and it just fit perfectly. So when that came on the first time, I was just—it was such a huge relief. Um, there were a couple points like that. So. Good, good. Well, let's walk around his aircraft. You can kind of point out some of the details and customization because that's what experimental is all about. Is able to customize like a hot rod of the sky. Yeah. Let's do it. You mentioned you have a unique engine to this airframe. How did that come about to be as far as the, the choice? Yeah, so I went with the Lycoming IL-390. Um, I have a great relationship with Lycoming and I've trusted those engines for years and years. I had a, a Mooney uh, with an IL-360 uh, on it. Just, again, a really reliable engine. And the whole reason I went with Lycoming was just, I'm in Utah, I'm not around cornfields. If I have an engine out, it's very likely my life is over. Um, just very dangerous terrain to have that kind of problem. So I knew that I could trust Lycoming and it's not that I can't trust other engines, I just know the reliability is like driven into the core of a Lycoming engine. Went with this engine, specifically the 390, I wanted just a little more power. I live in high density altitude, this does not have a turbo on it. So high density altitude means I need a little more juice. So I decided to go with the 215 horsepower. It's the YIO EXP289 variant of this engine. Great engine, extremely reliable, and I can keep the cooling very nice. Honestly, I fly with a lot of my Rotax friends and I can continue climbing all day and they have to stop for a little bit to cool down and then keep going. It, it, it honestly, it climbs like a, a, a bat out of hell. It's a really impressive engine. Um, the first of its kind on this aircraft and I'm seeing really impressive performance numbers. I mean, I've, I've set a few online, but more or less I can cruise putting some gas in the engine, I can get about 120 miles an hour in cruise, uh, but I can also pull it back to roughly eight gallons an hour and still get the 95 to 98 miles an hour cruise that I, it is really nice econom economical economy cruise. And attached um, to that power, so you got quite a cord on the prop, the Hartzell. Yes, so it's the Hartzell Trailblazer. This is the 80 inch variant of this. I was warned about doing a constant speed, but because I have such a large engine, it can actually take advantage of that prop really well. That's a lot of my performance comes into this prop and the fact that I can adjust it in flight. Now that does, I do sacrifice by having quite a bit of weight on my nose. My airplane is quite nose heavy. Um, I plan to make some adjustments. I know that Hartzell now just announced that uh, for the first time in 50 years, they're now producing ground adjustable fixed pitch props, which will probably take roughly 30 pounds off the nose of my aircraft. 
humongous. Obviously, everybody knows uh, uh, Zenith's like a little bit more uh, CG in the rear just because of how you want to take off and stall uh, performance. So um, I plan to make some adjustments with the CG and, and see what I can do and play with it. I'm still so new. There's only 34 hours on this airframe right now. Thank heaven for task-based flight testing. I was able to get it here in time. But um, it's still so fresh that I haven't had the chance other than through cruise flight to truly experience the landing and takeoff performance of this aircraft. Dynon Avionics at Dynon.com, offering everything from state-of-the-art glass cockpit options to advanced control modules that power and control your entire aircraft. Gradia Aero Group at GradiaAero.com, proudly representing these best-in-class brands for experimental general aviation. Sherwings, BD Aviation, and MW Fly. KFA, Kit Planes for Africa, engineered for adventure and build for the bush is their motto. Offering several stole kit aircraft options like the Expedition, Safari, Bush Baby, and Explorer. Find them online at kitplanesforafrica.co.za. Bravo Fox at bravo-fox.com. The U.S. distributor for black shape aircraft providing sales, maintenance, spare parts, and repair services. Located at the Sheridan Airport in Indiana. Visit us online at experimentalaircraftchannel.com for all things DIY aviation. And consider supporting us on our Patreon page to help us bring you more original aviation content. All right, Carson, so I think you probably have one of the most customized, custom looking interior uh, to go along with your, your paint scheme. But uh, what did you come up with uh, with this design specifically? So the interior and the design of the airplane is actually based off of my tattoo, which is a sectional chart of Zion National Park. This is the first flight I took my wife and kids on as their pilot. Really? Really, it's a special tattoo to me. I love topography. I love the sectional chart appearance. And I turned it into a paint scheme. And then I also, you know, so uh, Artcraft Paint painted the airplane. They made it beautiful. Um, I also utilized Evoke Aircraft Design to help me come up with the design, like take my design and make it uh, into a design. And then Artcraft did all the paint itself. And then I, I worked with Daniel at Sport Aircraft Seats to do these custom seats. And I kind of sent him the idea and he's like, that seems a little crazy, but let's give it a try. And now it's, honestly, it's one of the centerpieces of this entire aircraft. The seats turned out incredible. Um, and now there are actually multiple aircraft companies who are, are doing the same thing. In fact, like the Helio Courier, all their seats are now these seats. So it's very cool. Um, I love seeing people love this design and I love seeing it kind of, you know, being a trendsetter in that sense. So a lot of people name their aircraft and you went after this Whiskey Neat. Now, is this just the name of your aircraft or are you plan on doing a new branding separate from Wearworthy <laughs> and making some new products? Yeah, so Whiskey Neat is, was nicknamed um, Wearworthy's brand started in 2021. So my end number is 21 Whiskey Whiskey, 2021 for the year it started, Whiskey Whiskey for Wearworthy. And then I love whiskey and I only drink it neat. So I was like, Whiskey Neat, it just sounds great. And that's why I kind of uh, brought in the oranges and the warm oaky colors to kind of tie in the grays. And it just, it felt right, it really did. So that's where Whiskey Neat comes in and uh, that's how it got a name. Don't be flying with a glass of uh, whiskey. Yeah, definitely not gonna be flying with an open <laughs> bottle, that's for sure. All right, so talk to us about the, uh, the panel layout here. Yeah, so this is my Garmin panel. Um, it's got the dual G3X setup with the, uh, I believe, 10 and a half inch screen and the seven inch screen portrait. I do all of my primary flight displays on this. I'll typically have the PFD on this side, my moving map on this side, and then I do engine monitoring on this side. So all of my technical data that I wanna make sure everything's running good. Um, interestingly enough, Extra Aircraft built my panel for me. Um, I utilized the amazing team at Aircraft Specialty to do my CAD cutout and make uh, the backing and. Uh, all of that, but um, the the panel, the carbon fiber you're seeing here, which is a forged carbon fiber, was done by Extra Aircraft, and they brought it in. They it, it, it's got this really beautiful like particle look um, that is very unique. I've not seen it in a lot of. It's uh, kind of like a muted carbon. It really is, yeah. And I saw one on one of their planes and reached out to them, and they're like, "Let's do it for years." It was really cool. So I joke now that my airplane is plus and minus 10g capable. Right. <laughs> Definitely not, but it's a it, it's a beautiful panel. So I noticed you're using the dual stick option, which Zenith. Uh, as a standard has a center stick. What made you decide to go with this and have you flown both to see how much difference it really is? I have flown both. Um, I have no qualms against the Y stick. I just personally, I preferred the dual stick. Um, I would, you know, 
definitely encourage anybody who decides to dual the, do the dual stick to get ready for a little bit of extra effort. It's uh, it is definitely some work to get it feeling as good as the Y stick does, um, but it, I, I still like it. Um, it. It is a great option. It's fun to fly. I just kind of preferred having a, a dual stick. I didn't want to have two, a, a dual throttle configuration. I really wanted my stack to be all in the center. So sure. that's what I went with. I just, the overall layout felt better to me. So looking around the, uh, the cabin and the baggage area, I see something kind of unique. You've got a track system up by your sunroof. What's, what's that about? Yeah, so I utilized, the team at 67 Designs helped me put a lot of different cool things on this airplane for content creation and, and filming. So these balls I can actually use, I have cameras mounted here and then I can run power from this port to that. So when I flip this camera switch up here, it'll activate all of the cameras that I have on my plane, turn them on and they start recording, which is actually a safety feature for me as a, a pilot who wants to fly and record. It's really dangerous for pilots who are wanting to do YouTube or record their flights to be worried about their cameras and if they're recording properly. And that's what this switch takes that whole factor out for me. If I flip it, I don't think about my cameras anymore. They're doing their job just because of this. And then when I'm done, I can turn it off. It'll stop the recording. It'll shut down the cameras. Very simple and straightforward. This rail also has these little grabby mounts here, which will, and I haven't officially announced this, but which will mount my Starlink, which will fit right into this space. It's the perfect space for it. I don't usually, I don't, this is a three seat variant of the aircraft. This, the Super Duty can have three seats, but I only plan to put someone back there, likely in an emergency or maybe my kids, honestly. I, I think I'm gonna do a dual seat belt configuration for my two little kids. And, uh, but I don't see myself using that much outside of packing it full of gear. So reality, the Starlink is so you can go live anywhere on the planet, <laughs> even in the back country. I don't know how much I'll be going live. <laughs> I would only ever do that. It's, it's a fun idea, but it's a dangerous one. And I would, I would only ever do that if I had someone who was doing the, the live side of things and I was focused entirely on flying. All right, Carson, so becoming more and more popular these days, it's, it seems like more and more technology we have, we, we don't have more time. Mm -hmm. And people are wanting to do builder assist and that kind of stuff, and that's becoming a popular option. You've chosen to build the majority of this yourself, minus paint, you said. So what, what do you think is the key to, to getting it done? Because you actually got this done in kind of a record amount of time. Yeah, we did it about two and a half years. That said, it was still a roughly 1,200 hour build. Um, I would say those who are looking into this, the Super Duty and a lot of these match hold kits that Zenith is producing, they're great. Um, I would definitely still budget around a thousand hours to get it done. It's a lot of work. There are things that can always come up. Unless you do not veer from the plans at all, you are definitely going to be probably pushing that thousand uh, hour range roughly on any of the builds. It's just, there's a lot of factors that can play into that number. Some have gotten it done faster for sure, but unless you're an experienced builder, it takes a little bit of time. I built this entire plane myself. I had a help, especially here in the last six months, with a couple friends who would come along and help me with a build. Uh, one who actually flew out with me, I was like, your whole trip, all expenses paid, come to Oshkosh. He, he helped me get it over the finish line. So I definitely had a couple friends who were just savvy and fun and helpful. And then I had the paint done by Artcraft. They painted it outright. I, I'm not skilled with paint. I think some people are, but I wanted the plane to really shine. and I truly think that it's worth having professionals paint the plane. It's just such, by the time you pay for all the supplies, you're still like seven to 10 grand into it. You might as well pay a little extra and have somebody do it for you. And then I had a little help with my avionics and my engine as well from the team at Zion Airmotive, who I just don't have a lot of experience with those things and I just wanted it to be done right. So, yeah. Okay, so if, being having done it now, if you were to do it a second time, where are some areas that you might say, if I had more money than time, I'll go ahead and spend that money and have somebody do this. I mean, I'm definitely would never be opposed to doing a, a factory assisted option. Um, I do think it's a beautiful option for someone to get to know their plane. I, while there's some fun braggingness of, I built this, it's really cool. I don't look down on anyone who hasn't built their plane. I just truly believe it's something that I am a safer pilot because I know every single way that every single thing on this airplane works. Factory Assist gives you kind of the crash course on every piece of your plane. You build it, you do a, a lot of the stuff. Maybe you don't have to pull every rivet. Maybe you're not putting every piece in place, but you're doing a lot of that. And enough to qualify for 51% and then therefore get your repairman certificate. So clearly it's still an exceptional way to be safe and capable. If you've got the money, I mean, it, it probably took more years off of my life <laughs> in the time that I took to build this. It's a, it's a, you know, it's an intense process, but if you want to fly, it's, you can't beat having a plane ready in six months instead. All right, Carson, kind of in closing, uh, obviously you built this for an adventure. You're going to be having adventures. Where can people follow you to see 
all the cool places you're going. Yeah, you can follow me on any of my social channels on Wearworthy. I'm on pretty much every social media platform. Uh, very active on Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. Um, yeah, I, I primarily do short form, wanting to try some long form stuff, but I. I want to go take this plane and have adventures with it. It's uh, it's what it was made for. Honestly, I painted it beautiful, but I cannot wait to beat the living snot out of it. And that's just the point. That's why I built it, is to really take it into the backcountry and show off the beautiful place where I live and the beautiful place that this plane is kind of a love letter to. Yeah. So, so we're in July right now. We're going to be entering into truly the flying season in the fall. What, some, what are some of the venues you have planned that you might go to? Maybe people could see you in person. Yeah, if someone wants to go see me, um, the Zenith Homecoming is a great opportunity to see me. I'll be there in September, third week of September in Mexico, Missouri. Um, I also plan to make an appearance at the High Sierra Fly-In this year. Um, I plan to go like the U.S. Aircraft Expo in November down in uh, Scottsdale. There's a couple places that I plan to go and I will likely have my plane with me in all of them. So. Thanks for watching this episode on the Experimental Aircraft Channel. Quick shout out to our patrons over on Patreon and our co-pilot status, Zach Newsom, Mike Babcock, Lynn Gardner, Gary Martin, and Michael Smith. We'll see you in the next episode.